people of God, theology at its most raw level is practical and even pedestrian. It's the ready hands when a new family is moving into town. It's the preparation for hearty soups for a fellowship meal. It's the effort to make a dinner table beautiful. Some of you at Providence are here in this congregation, have been for many years. Some of you are here because of the theology that we uphold, the theology of the Reformed tradition. And it is very true that we did write the great tomes of Christian history. We did produce Calvin and Bootser and Knox and the Puritans and Jonathan Edwards and many others. We have the intellectual squadron on our side. But these men, those whom I've just listed, were also deeply shaped by a sense of the holy. They were deeply shaped by a sense of the holy. There was a piety that they possessed, not only in their actions, but in their writings, that was good and right and beneficial. Jonathan Edwards once wrote, Men can be happy in no other God but the God of Israel, for he is the only fountain of happiness. The only fountain of happiness. Can we talk like that? He is the only fountain of happiness. Or have we at times climbed so high on Mount Olympus that we have forgotten Mount Calvary itself? I remember many years ago I was sitting in an examination for ordination where the minister asked the candidate to ordination the following question. Do you, young man, love the Lord Jesus Christ? And I was thinking, home run. To which the candidate huffed and puffed about the nature of love without ever giving a definitive answer to the question that was posed. Now imagine yourself persecuted one day for your faith. Evil men are ready to kill you for your belief in Jesus Christ. And they're, as they're about to kill you, they ask, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And at that moment, as death is nigh, you start pontificating about the four loves and whether the persecutor has actually read C.S. Lewis, whether they understand his distillation of the four loves, eros and filio, and on and on. Brothers and sisters, you should this morning, all of you, be able to say without hesitation, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Love in John's epistles, love, as we mentioned, love protects, love hosts, love is hospitable. Love comes embodied in the person of Jesus because he protects, he is hospitable toward us. Our love is an extension of his mercy. Christ pours his affections upon us as sinners, and the outwork of that is the overflow of our lives in a ministry of mercy to the world. And because that is the case, and since that is the case, there is no other alternative for the Christian. We are responsible for building one another up in love and good works. And we read this in 3 John, beginning in verse 5. Beloved, it is a faithful thing, he says, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, in a manner dignified of a God worshiper. What we have seen is that there is undoubtedly a conflict taking place in the, pastor, in the pastorate of Gaius and his congregation, but John's pastoral response is before he enters into the critique, into the challenges, the confrontation motif of this congregation, what he does is he builds them up first before moving to that next step. The saints in this congregation, he says, they are known for affirming the good deeds of one another. They go around testifying to the good works of the people in their congregation. Remember in the passage in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, he is there. Jesus is saying what John is saying. When two or three witnesses are present to affirm Christ's deeds, to affirm the service of the brothers in the church, in unity, Jesus is there. Jesus is present in their efforts. He is present in their encouragement. So how does this flesh itself out in our congregation this morning? Well, first and foremost, what this means for us is that we ought not to 
fall into bouts of jealousy when others are doing good in our midst. We ought not to fall into bouts of jealousy when others are doing good in our midst. Paul says in Romans 12 that you are, that we are to outdo one another in love by showing honor. If there's ever a call to competition within the church, this is it. You want to compete with one another? Outdo one another in love and showing honor to one another. If you're going to be with one another, outdo them in encouraging your fellow members in their good deeds on behalf of the congregation. Don't be jealous that one family can do more hospitality than yours or that one family can volunteer more for church feasts more so than yours. And part of this, of course, we talked about this many times throughout the years, that part of this is knowing what season of life you're in and what your strengths are as individuals in the body. Now, let's say that you are at a stage where you have a bunch of little humans running around the house causing all the blessed chaos that little humans cause, well, your stage in life is going to require you to be a bit more conservative in your efforts. You may be able to host once a month instead of every week. Or some of you have professional demands that are really heavy at this stage of life, health issues that require a lot of care. While you can't use all these things as rationales or justifications for doing nothing, for not doing good in the body, Service in the church is going to look differently for you than it may look for others at different stages of life. But your responsibility through all of it, through whatever stage of life you find yourself in, your responsibility is not to increase in jealousy for their good works, but to testify in the congregation of their good works. You see the difference? You want to be the kind of person who always points out godly examples rather than harumphing around in self-pity. So if you are a new family at Providence Church, wanting to grow in the gift of hospitality, the gift of child rearing or friendship, keep your eyes open in this congregation. Keep your eyes open for families who do these things well. And then you pull them aside and you say, hey, coffee at five on Wednesday. See you there. Learn from one another. In fact, one of the beauties of a growing congregation such as ours is the sheer amount of of giftedness we have in this body and the sheer amount of resources that we now can learn from and grow into and be aided by we need to be mindful of these things and we need to be grateful for the resources grateful for all the gifts that god has added to our congregation and when we live in such a way in the way that i have just described we are preparing our people to go out and minister to others in word and in deed, we're preparing one another to go out and minister to others in word and in deed. John was very firm in his conviction. He was exceedingly aware that what forms the church is her hospitality to one another, especially those in the household of faith. Now imagine being a Christian this morning. Imagine that you were a Christian living in a highly non-Christian country. And your Christian friends and relatives, they come to visit you living in that hostile world. And you threw them a whole CREC kind of party, you know, with doxology and champagne, the whole thing. Non-Christians, John says, are going to show contempt for you because hospitality to your people, hospitality to your tribe, is a worldview expression that offends false religion. Hospitality is a worldview expression that offends false religion and this is what's happening in this epistle here in john's day the jews were hostile to any group that showed support for the cause of messiah jesus they were hostile to any group that showed support for the cause of jesus and so when pastors were coming into town when they were coming to john's town they were coming to visit a church some people shied away from hosting that pastor or that member because they were fearful of what the Jews might think of their hospitality. They were afraid to be Christian. It was easy to be Christian when it didn't require anything of them. But when the faith begins to demand opening your rooms and your kitchens and your living room, now you've gone too far. That's a lot. But beloved, as I've said before, theology is practical like that. Theology is as practical as apple pie and Shrove Tuesday pancakes. That's how practical it is. 
John says, continuing in 3 John, you will do well, he says, to send them out on their journey in a manner worthy of God. If they come to Providence Church, if they come by Providence, John says, show them hospitality. Show them kindness and generosity, and that may mean last-minute pizza, or it may mean something more planned, a planned get-together. But the point is, we must be ready for hospitality in season and out of season. And we need to all here this morning get accustomed, this will be hard for some of you, to get accustomed to showing others our messy home, and that may include, you know, getting all that laundry in its appropriate hiding place real quickly. But John knew that hospitality was not always the kind of thing that you prepared for. He knew that. And sometimes the opportunity arose, and then what do you have to do at that moment? You have to take off your perfectionist hat and say, honey, let's go for it. Why? Because better a dinner of herbs where love is than a feast where contention is present, Solomon says. Let the newcomer to our congregation, let the newcomer to the local church, let them see your love. And then when they go back home, they remember the generosity of this congregation. Verse 7, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, that's the name of Jesus, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth, that we may be koinonia for the truth. For here, the reference to Gentiles is a reference to paganism, is a reference to any group that is outside of the church. Some of these missionaries coming through, receiving the care of the local church and hospitality, they're being enriched by the hospitality of the people. Because this is important, because this may be the only time when they are benefited or enriched by the hospitality of food and fellowship, by the hospitality of God's people because they find themselves usually surrounded by pagans who show no hospitality to them. But here, the saints are doing work as unto the Lord, and they're expecting nothing in return. Come to my home. Sleep in my room. Here's food for you. Here's everything you need to refresh your soul. John says the church should be welcoming to these travelers. Now, there's a particular reference here to missionaries, the modern term missionaries, but the application is broader because when we support other Christians by opening our homes when they're in town, what we are doing, according to the Apostle John, is we are doing a work of truth building. That's what hospitality is. It's a work of truth building. When you receive these saints, you are sharing in their mission. Remember, that's what the word koinonia means, a sharing in mission. Now, you may not be called to be a missionary to Kenya, but when you open the home to a missionary in Kenya, you share in their missionary work. You are supporting and building that work in Kenya with them. You are united to them as you support and encourage them and build them up in the household of faith. Hospitality is a truth-building ritual. Hospitality is a truth building ritual but then john says that some in the church they don't share your values providence they don't share your values and they even discourage such rituals from being exercised within the church verse 9 i have written something to the church but diatrophies who likes to put himself first he doesn't acknowledge our pastoral authority. So if I come, John says, I'll bring up what he's doing. Uh-oh. Talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, Diotrephes refuses to welcome the brothers, and he even goes so far as to stop those who wants to welcome the brothers, and he throws them out of the church. He puts them out of the church. Oh, the audacity. Some in the congregation, they are going to be envious of the progress and ministry of others. And one feature that characterizes them is a lack of submission to Pastor Gaius. Now, when we talk about submission to pastors, this is not blind submission. Pastors 
like anyone else, needs to be tested in, in their long-term faithfulness, in their manner of life. In other words, it's very hard, and it would be hard for you to submit to me if I preached on hospitality and encouragement, but I didn't do either, or I minimized the value and virtue of both. I didn't have vigor or fervor in doing these things. But the central way people like Diotrephes, the way they fail to submit to their leadership is by tearing down their leadership and causing confusion in the church about the pastor's authority. He's going to say something like, he may be your pastor, but he's not mine. Or he may say something much more common, I am my own pastor, there is no authority greater than mine. Well, that is pride. Let me quote you exactly how John qualifies his behavior. And I quote, wicked nonsense. Also translated in other places as malicious slander. 3 John, verse 10. The presbyter says, Gaius, my old friend, when I come to see you again, I'm going to confront this troublemaker. I'm going to tell him exactly what the gospel demands of him. And what's unique about this troublemaker, this dragon, Diotrephes, is that he talks a big game about his knowledge, but he refuses to welcome the brothers into his home. He refuses to open the door to the brethren. He does not want a practical theology. No, he does not. He wants a self-serving theology. That's what he wants. Oh, and there is more, John says. He acts like all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him because he says to other congregations, don't you dare be hospitable to these visitors. Don't do that. I don't know what the rationale may be, but they may be something like, they don't agree with every ounce of our doctrine and they are not truly reformed. If they were, we'd let them in. Diatrophy sows discord, not only in his failure to submit, but also in his denial of the good works of the people, his refusal to enter into, participate in the good deeds of the congregation. And he seeks to make a case against the good being done in the body. That's what he's doing. He's minimizing the hospitality efforts taking place in the church. He's always suggesting changes but he's always unwilling to change himself. John says, Diotrephes refuses to welcome the brothers, and he also stops those who want to, and he puts them out of the church. He is judge, and he is executioner. Now, this is a little difficult to grasp in our 21st century context, unless you see the precarious nature of those early churches. They didn't have the luxury, they didn't have the, the stability of being surrounded by 300-plus churches in Scambia County with qualified ministers. They were living in a time of persecution, and it was a common strategy that took place in the early church. Jude alludes to this, but John is alluding to it as well. It's a common strategy for men to use the opportunity of the vulnerability of the church to go into it to cause tumult. They would come to the churches, and they would urge the congregation to start doubting the authority of their leaders, to subvert the order of the local church, go and cause chaos. They're vulnerable. They're open. Tell them that hospitality is unnecessary. These troublemakers did not want to bring theology to the ground level. They did not want to bring theology to the ground level. They refused to live at peace with one another, and they were always seeking to stir strife. And John was coming to put the house of God in order. And whereas Diotrephes held himself in high esteem, John's arrival would end his self-appointed papacy. Interesting, the name Diotrephes literally means one who is nourished by the gods or one who's nourished by Zeus, literally. Diotrephes viewed himself as godlike in the church. He was the godlike figure within the congregation. And John, the great bishop of this presbytery, John would show this zealot Diotrephes that his accusations towards the brethren actually should be applied to himself. Diotrephes, which you accuse the brethren, is what you yourself do, and you will be condemned for it. Providence, saints, 
You can only be happy if the fountain of all your happiness is Jesus. You can only find delight in the life of the church when you genuinely take pleasure in the good works being done all around you in this congregation. And what we need, the church has always exercised, is a theology that is pastoral, a theology that changes our table manners during the week so that when we come together to God's holy table on his holy day, our hearts are already filled with the habits of grace that have been formed. And now we come together ready to receive the fountain of all grace at his sacred table. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.